Welcome to Worth Quoting, a special speaker series sponsored by the Women's Center at Florida Community College at Jacksonville. I'm Carol Miner, your host, and we have a very interesting program for you today. We have Richard Fazzini, who is a, an Egyptologist and an archaeologist who's here to speak to us about the Ramses exhibit that's visiting Jacksonville. And helping me interview Mr. Fazzini is Earl Ferris, who is the Assistant Dean for Humanities and Fine Arts. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what it is that an archaeologist and Egyptologist does. How did you get to be an Egyptologist? Oh, I got to be an Egyptologist through compulsion. Uh, I started graduate school in art history, and I started at the beginning. And, and I you never, never got, got any further. <laughs> never got any further. Uh, took courses in Egypt, the ancient Near East, beginning hieroglyphs, and then after two semesters of school, they sent me off. Uh, to Egypt one summer on an excavation and it was enough to keep me going. If I live long enough I may become a classical archaeologist but right now I'm, st I'm still working on Egypt. What's your major emphasis in Egypt or your major interest in the area? Well I guess uh, in, in general I'm an historian of Egyptian art. I mean that's one part of my training but uh, I've grown from that in ways. I mean, I, I do that still, but I dig holes in the ground. I mean, I dig up temples and, and the terrain in between them. And temples uh, often uh, involve you with art, relief, sculpture. But when there's houses built around temples, you're into urban archaeology and the, uh, the remains you find in ancient houses, broken pots, uh, bits and pieces of the refuse of humanity. So uh, I've uh, spent a great deal of time worrying about that. And in recent days, because I do have six temples to worry about, I've been trying to learn a lot more about Egyptian religion than I ever knew before. So you keep learning? Um, yes, that's, uh, that's the goal of it. Um, one is an Egyptologist and one has to do something for a living. I mean, one works in a museum, one teaches in a university, and that's all part of what you like doing, but uh, if you're a scholar, what you are really doing is spending your life learning because you like doing that. Okay, well Basically. you have some particular um, expertise in the Ramses II era and the Ramses II is visiting Jacksonville and we're, the whole city is so excited about it. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with Ramses II digging? Uh, okay, well uh, the site we dig at is a part of this great complex known as Karnak, uh, which is um, a large archaeological zone just outside the modern city of Luxor, and that's uh, between three and 400 miles south of Cairo. In antiquity, this was the city of Thebes, and Karnak was the site of some of the major state temples of the New Kingdom. Uh, the New Kingdom is dynasties 18 through 20. Dynasties 19 through 20 are also the Ramesid period. Ramesses II is a king of dynasty 19. Um, our temples, uh, the ones at the Brooklyn Museum, it's a Brooklyn Museum excavation, uh, the temples we're responsible for, uh, virtually all of them have parts at least built during the New Kingdom and uh, during the 19th dynasty. So in effect, we've been trying to put together the pieces of these temples, which have never been fully excavated, uh, and parts of those pieces are Ramesid. The largest Ramesid thing I ever found was a, a large stele, uh, a tablet, if you will, but it's a pretty large tablet. It's around 14 feet tall. Uh, and you found was, that in the dirt? Yeah, it was found fallen face down in front of a temple uh, and cracked in three parts. And it's um, Egyptian alabaster, which is a form of limestone, and it weighs around mm, 44 tons. Um, and where it had fallen in antiquity was a place which then got built up with houses when the temples were no longer functioning. And so there's large mounds of debris around the stela with houses in them. And digging those takes a long time. It's very slow, laborious work. So uh, there was no room to get a rigging in. So when we found this stela and realized it was decorated facing the ground, we consulted with some engineers and with the Egyptian Antiquities Department. and. Um, tunneled underneath it, building walls as we went to copy the inscriptions. So you didn't raise it, you just... Not yet, it'll come up someday, but it's, um, the whole area in front of it has to be excavated before you can get the rigging in to put it up. And this is around a quarter million dollar undertaking just to get this up and 
and mounted. But digging underneath it, we found that it was a stele of King Ramesses II. It did describe the temple in front of uh, which it stood. Uh, and the evidence of that inscription, plus another two stray blocks found, helped us to identify this temple um, for what it was. I mean, prior to this time, it was called Temple A. And now it's called? Now it is the uh, temple of, it is the temple of millions of years of Ramesses, beloved of Amun, uh, and followed by effective for Amun, enduring, and unfortunately it breaks there. So we still have to find the rest of the name of the, the temple. The rest of the name of the temple. But it's a temple of millions of years uh, dedicated to Amun. And a temple of millions of years is a term which refers to procession temples, temples w in which a bark of a god was kept uh, and uh, in which the bark was carried forth in religious processions. Uh, such temples are in part temples to the god um, and as well to the king. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the significance of Ramses himself, the pharaoh? Is there, is there I mean, we're, the Egyptian government is bringing over this exhibit. Many cities in the United States are getting to enjoy it. Um, is this something outstanding? Is Ramses somebody that we should pay attention to? Is he significant? Well, in the grand scale of uh, Egyptology, Ramses II is certainly uh, worth paying attention to. Um, I suppose he's become something of a household name uh, since the, uh, the Nubian campaign to rescue the Nubian temples uh, from the rising Lake Nasser behind the New High Dam. Um, so he's famous. That, that's enough in a way. I mean, the people have a certain interest, but he was king for 66 years and two months. He was also, if you count the time, he sort of shared the, the throne with his father as prince regent. Uh, he, was, he either ruled Egypt or had a hand in ruling Egypt for 75 years. Uh, as a result, he came to be one of the great builder kings of Egypt. I mean, in part because he was one of the great generals of Egypt and waged successful wars and the country was prosperous and there was revenue to uh, build these temples. I mean, in fact, the name of Ramesses is probably the, Ramesses II, the there were 11 Ramesses, uh, is probably the most common name you can find on Egyptian monuments. I mean, one uh, very famous Egyptian Egyptologist uh, once uh, described him as uh, Ramesses the Inevitable. Uh, I think you know, every time you turn a corner in Egypt, you'll see his name. Now, among the monuments he built are some of Egypt's most impressive temples. And by Egypt, I have to point out there's also Nubia to the south, which is not Egypt proper, but Egyptian Nubia. Uh, the Temple of Abu Simbel, a, you know, a whole host of other temples there. Um, temples throughout the country and at Thebes, major, major buildings. Um, he helped finish the great hypostyle hall at Karnak. Uh, which his father uh, and grandfather started. This is not a small building. Its central columns are 80 feet tall, which is it's large. It's standard even. Um, and it's over 300 feet wide. So, I mean, this, this one hole that he put in front of the temple is uh, over a football field wide. Uh, his temple, uh, he added a similar large front to the temple of Luxor, which is also uh, down the road from Karnak, which is one of the major uh, buildings still standing in Egypt of the New Kingdom. And his temple, the Ramesseum, was, um, which is not as well preserved as these other buildings, is nevertheless uh, a major, major monument in terms of architecture and art, uh, as are the sculptures and reliefs in it. You'll read in a lot of books, if you read a lot of books on Egypt, that um, with the Ramesid period came the decline of the art of the New Kingdom. Um, Why that is it the decline? Well, in the 18th dynasty, the artist really achieved great heights in, in many, many areas. And uh, their achievements, to an extent, could not be sustained. But that's not necessarily true of the art of the early Ramesid period into which Ramesses II fits. Uh, there's also a problem that uh, much of what is really fine, at least in my opinion, of Ramesid art is bad mouth, is that a good term, by some <laughs> art historians. No, I mean, 
In the West, we like to look at things and say they're good or bad to an extent based on how Western they are. So one of the things that was happening in the 18th dynasty is that the artists were getting into more large-scale scenes, landscapes, a little bit more perspective, uh, all sorts of little things that appeal to us as Westerners because they're a little closer to our artistic traditions than what you get in a great deal of Egyptian art, which is kind of, you know, frontal, the, the relief figures with these drawing conventions which seem bizarre to people. Uh, strange scenes of the king offering to gods, gods with animal heads, things we don't understand. Um, to an extent, the Ramesid period was one in which religious scenes came to the fore. So that's one of the reasons that it, it, it gets seen as a decline. Later, in the late Ramesid period, Dynasty 20, to be sure, a lot of things, uh, the country was no longer very prosperous, uh, the artists didn't have the wherewithal, and some of it is indeed not great art. Uh, but that's not really true of most of the art produced under Ramesses II. And if I've mentioned all of his buildings, mm -hmm. uh, there's all the private people who lived under him. and, and uh, a vast majority, I th if, I, if I remember correctly, of the e objects in this exhibition are, in fact, works of private That's people. Right. Important people, to be sure. I mean, ancient Egypt was not a country in which art was for the masses. It was for the upper class. Um, upper class, um, at least middle class. I mean, poor people could not command stone monuments, could not command statues, steely could not command fancy tombs, could not have a statue carved to be placed in a temple to keep their name with the god forever and ever. Which is what the intent was, mm -hmm. to live forever. <sighs> yeah, now you'll read also in a lot of places that the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death. And there are all of these funerary monuments. And that's true. There are all of these funerary monuments because the ancient Egyptians came to the conclusion that they could conquer death not because they were obsessed with death. That's pretty uppity, isn't it? <laughs> is, we, um. is the Pharaoh, is the Pharaoh Ramses, the Pharaoh of Moses? When you talk about religious significance, is he? Uh, Does anybody know? Okay, um, I, I'm no expert on biblical history, but um, Ramses could certainly be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Um, and in fact, um, I, I think um, a reasonable number of scholars believe that to be the case. And if so, Exodus would have occurred probably between his 15th and 20th years uh, as, a pharaoh. as pharaoh. So, but that would have been a very unimportant thing for Ramses. Because it was a small population or because it was a defeat and he didn't want anybody to know that it was a well, failure? Probably both. But um, kings did not commemorate defeats. Um, on the other hand, the northern part of Egypt long had all sorts of people living in it from various places. I mean, there were, uh, there were outright uh, prisoners of war taken uh, and, and settled in, in parts of Egypt, uh, and many of them went into the army and others did work, uh, construction work for the crown. And then there were other people uh, who had moved into the delta who were settled there, but like every uh, Egyptian, except of the highest ranks, were liable for uh, conscription. Um, not necessarily for the army, but to work for the crown. And so uh, what you would have had in terms of exodus is one group of these people uh, living uh, in the delta and subject to the call for labor, etc. Now, uh, for this group of people leaving the country and going somewhere else is a whole new beginning and a major, major event. From the point of view of an Egyptian empire, this is, well, that's unfortunate, but it's not the major event that it, that it, that it was for the Hebrews. Certainly. Uh, you met, you uh, referred to uh, Ramses as the inevitable. Uh, we, we think of Ramses the exuberant, uh, <clears throat> his longevity, the, the number of sons and, and concubines, wives that he had, uh, the, the grand scale that you mentioned that uh, we associate with him. 
How, how much of, of uh, the real Ramses then can we believe from this? In other words, uh, he was a general and, and he, according to the temple inscriptions, he did these miraculous feats. How much of that can we attribute to fact and how much of that is the desire of a king not to commemorate a defeat? Uh, I think in some of his more monumental inscriptions you get um, a good deal more truth than you often get in re Egyptian historical inscriptions, especially concerning warfare. Now, uh, Exodus is a different matter. This is not a war. I mean, this is an event that happened whatever, whatever your picture of Exodus is. But then there's the Battle of Kadesh. Now, for, th for the viewer, the Battle of Kadesh, okay. Uh, one of the main goals of Egyptian foreign policy uh, in the New Kingdom and, uh, was to dominate part Nubia to the south, which the Egyptians did not have much problem doing, and also parts of the Near East uh, to the Northeast. Uh, Ramesses, after a period, he and his father, his father Seti I and Ramesses, both took up the Egyptian cause in the Middle East after a period of time in which Egypt had been weak in the Middle East. Uh, and we're talking about years of battles. Uh, not year-long battles because in ancient days Egyptian battles seemed to be, the king marched out on a campaign for a couple of months and won or lost and then came back. And then life went on and other things and they rebuilt the army. And the, uh, so it isn't this you know, World War II, five years of, of, of bloody warfare. But Ramesses finally gets himself into a situation early in his reign where he's coming up against uh, the kingdom of the Hittites. And Ramesses, uh, as his father before him, badly wants to gain control of parts of Syria firmly. And a key city is this city called Kadesh on the Orontes River. Now Ramesses marches off uh, and along the way with his um, four battalions, four armies rather, he finds out he bumps into two Bedouin, literally. I mean, his, his, his spies bring in two Bedouin uh, who give him um, the wrong information, shall we say. They inform him that the Hittite king has heard he's coming. The Hittite king is not ready for a war. The Hittite king is 120 miles away and does not want to come south to meet Ramesses. So the Egyptians get a little careless and their troops get strung out. And just as they come up to the city of Kadesh, they catch two Hittite spies and they learn from them that the king of the Hittites is right across the river, ready. Now, at this point, there's Ramesses with his lead unit. There's these other groups strung out and the Hittites hit them and hit them hard. At this point, Ramesses apparently rallies his troops and fights a holding action until his troops catch up with him and they can drive the Hittites back across the river. Night comes. Now, by this time, both tr sides have suffered losses of the type that they do not wish to continue the fight. Ramesses goes home. The Hittite king goes home. Ramesses carves this battle all over the temples of Egypt, huge scale. But, you know, the details are there in the inscriptions. He claims it's a great victory. But in that is all of the events, and they're all depicted hey, we listened to these two Bedouin, and they lied to us. <laughs> and then we moved forward, and we got in this rotten position. And the king can even call out to his father, the god Amun, now why hast thou forsaken me, mm -hmm. the god Amun? Uh, so there's an element of truth, and he can portray it as a great personal victory, or great victory even for Egypt, but they let those unfortunate little incidents go out. It's not a typical inscription which says the king marched forth, everybody did obeisance, he met the enemy, he beat them to death. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a real Ramesses in there. Okay, then I'd like to ask you this. This, this is the, the Ramesses that we see uh, on those carvings, you know, on those tomb walls. What about the real Ramesses? What about the, give me a, a, a typical day in the life of Ramesses. He, he wakes up in the morning in a typical day. Well, that's not so simple to do because um, um, 
I'm not sure if there were, you know, totally typical days. Uh, a king would have to spend some of his time dealing with affairs of state. Okay, he's not off on war. I mean, he's going to have to meet with his viziers. There's a vizier for southern Egypt, a vizier for northern Egypt. They're going to have to create state policy. He's going to have to hear petitions if they have to come to the king. He's going to have to give judgments. In theory, in Egypt, all justice comes from the king if it doesn't come from a god. He's also going to have to perform certain religious uh, ceremonies, and it depends where he is and what is happening at the time. Uh, in theory, the king is the only legitimate priest in Egypt. He is the son of the gods. He is the official intermediary between gods and humanity. And all of the religious rituals that are performed in temples in Egypt every day are done by priests acting as substitutes for the king. Um, now, obviously, he can't go through a morning, a noon, an evening ritual in every temple every day, but there's probably at least one religious ritual which he must uh, perform during the day. Uh, now, uh, handling the affairs of state, handling the religion, he's uh, probably now already uh, used up a good deal of his day. Um, given the number of wives and children he had, uh, well, one has to assume that he didn't see all his children all the time uh, <laughs> or <laughs> have to have dinner with them, but uh, one assumes there was a, at least a little time during the week for family life. Um, I don't know if that's answered your question, but that's not the Ramesses you see in the art, really. The Ramesses is always a single okay, warrior. No. Well, there's, there's the Ramesses, something of a human being you can see in the art, as I've told you, in the battle scenes. Then there are certain sculptures which are a little bit, you know, of Ramesses the human, maybe he and his wife, whichever one at the time. Um, but then there are all of the other sculptures which are made for totally different purposes. Uh, they're Ramesses the god or a manifestation of the god. So for example, uh, I think the, probably the most impressive object in this exhibition is a figure of a falcon, huge falcon, and there's a little child, child squatting in front of it. Um, now this is Ramesses, but you know now. Do you see a human king there, a little squatting child? Well, you can say that's the king as a child, but the whole statue is a rebus. Uh, the falcon is Ray, I mean, you know, it's, uh, the child is, the, is phonetically Mess, uh, the plant he holds is Sue, and it's Rama Sue, and it's a, it's a rebus of its, his name, uh, and the purpose of statues such as that is to kind of convey the picture of Ramesses as a god and un, a young god being born and behind him under the protection of, of a large deity. So in a statue such as that, you're not going to see Ramesses the human being. You're going to see Ramesses an official state, uh, well, demigod and sometimes uh, god incarnate on earth. Mm -hmm. You have to look at private statues in a way to get more of human beings. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, Ramesses versus Tut, King Tut, that came earlier in the 60s, I guess, in the 70s, when, yeah. when the Egyptians were coming here. Um, with Ramses, they're, I think, making the same attempt, only there's a lot of difference in the pharaoh. Can you, can you address that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I mean, well, I wouldn't want to say Tut on Common is unimportant. I mean, he played an important he got role so much more publicity at a than specific Ramsey's point. Getting. Well, he he got that publicity because in the 1920s his tomb was found, and although it had been robbed, it had not been badly robbed. So uh, his is the best preserved uh, royal burial, with all sorts of uh, gold and gilded objects in it. Even uh, though he's a minor king literally and figuratively. Yes, uh, and so you can't put down the importance of this stuff. There are bits and pieces from other royal tombs, but this gives us an idea of what a pharaoh, pharaoh's burial was like and the kinds of objects, both artistically and, and their religious significance, that went into a tomb. Uh, but uh, certainly that exhibition was almost entirely limited to this, this funerary goods. 
So you had you had and you had an exhibition of the funerary goods of one king. Splendid though some of them were, it was limited in its scope. The exhibition you have now is um, tries to do a bit more than that. There are sculptures which give you a picture of Ramesses, king is God. Uh, there are sculptures which give you uh, some uh, view of uh, the queens which went with him. There are uh, objects which give you an idea of important Egyptian religious rituals. I mean, there's a, a stele in there with a, a bark of Amun being carried forth, uh, uh, the beautiful Feast of the Valley, a major, major uh, religious ritual at Thebes. Um, there are funerary objects of uh, private people. I mean, a lovely uh, coffin lid, uh, the lady, what's her name, Isis, mm -hmm. the ivy Beautiful. hanging from, from her hands. Uh, there are uh, more minor objects, uh, all of these things we love to think of as, gee, they must have decorated the houses and weren't they beautiful. And in fact, that's probably true, uh, despite the fact that they, all of them also had a funerary role to play. I mean, uh, take it with you. Right, take it with you. You know. You can take it with you if you're an Egyptian. So. Yeah, so in a way, I mean, somebody goes into a Tutankhamun exhibition, they see one face of Egypt. And some of it was splendid, some of it uh, a little less splendid, but nevertheless, it's, it's one, one aspect. This kind of exhibition you could go in, I mean, one could go in and give 10 lectures on Egyptian art, you know, an hour each in front of those objects and not have exhausted it. If you had, we only have about, you know, a minute left, but if you had a minute to tell somebody how to enjoy an exhibit like this, or even the one you've got in the Berkeley Museum, how would they be able to enjoy it? Uh, read a little bit, well, there's a catalog, um, go in and look at the exhibition once, then go home and read a little, and then go back and really look. And try and put what you learned about art, religion, etc., into, you know, some sort of uh, gestalt to lapse into German <laughs> in your head, some sort of unified view. What does this mean? But while you're doing that, don't forget to look at some of those things and just step back and say, God, isn't that lovely? because some of them uh, should uh, appeal to you that way. And I understand that you have all of these marvelous educational programs where exactly. people can uh, um, learn That's without right. reading the catalog. That's right. We, we had the honor of training the, um, the volunteers there. So they should be a great wealth of, of information to everyone. They went through a 15-hour class that we provided. And we are giving many classes for the community so they can learn about it and go in and enjoy it and really get something out of it. So we appreciate your being with us and giving us your points of view and we we'll look forward to having you at uh, Kent Campus and South Campus and then again at FCCJ night as we celebrate our 20th anniversary. And thank you, Earl, for being with us. Thank You've you, You've been Carol. a tremendous help in training all the volunteers in the community. And we thank you all for being with us as well and hope that you have enjoyed this program. And if you haven't seen Ramsey's, we hope that you will. Thank you. <laughs>